Welcome to our video chat from home series. Uh, we're talking to ambassadors, to our advisory board members about what's happening with the pandemic and about what's happening in Canada-US relations. Today, I'm so excited that we have a distinguished business leader, former ambassador, former premier of New Brunswick, and we're talking to him from New Brunswick, I think, today. Welcome, Frank McKenna. Thank you very much, Scotty, and yes, I am in New Brunswick. Uh, well, thanks for joining us, and let's just start with um kind of how you see the state of canada u.s relations right now um in this crisis and and what do you see the what do you see the path forward for our two countries well it's a big question um the you know we we've had a lot of ups and downs going back 50 or even 100 years in the canada u.s relationship but at its root it's always fundamentally solid <clears throat> and my view is that it's fundamentally solid today um, I'd say that we have more uh, more obvious stress than usual, uh, probably at the at the um, at the top level. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, that President Trump has uh, has created a more America first attitude than we're used to seeing, and that's not just directed at Canada; it's directed at other countries around the world and 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 the globe writ large. So that's just fact; you can't change that. But we've gone through ups and downs before. I was I was ambassador for a prime minister who was heading into an election campaign, and uh, and and being hostile to America was part of his campaign, uh, really. And uh, and so we survived that, and we'll survive this because the underlying relationship is so strong. What's really blown me away, Scotty, is the public diplomacy that's taking place. Uh, the USMCA, in my view, is uh, is really the, the the creation of a huge number of interested political leaders and individuals on both sides of the border. You know, the Prime Minister and, and the President deserve their share. But I think ultimately we got this across the line because of the public diplomacy, especially in the United States, where business leaders, community leaders, uh, legislative leaders. Uh, agreed that this was the right thing to do. Similarly, with Section 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum, those weren't won at the presidential level. They were won at the congressional level through public diplomacy. And so I think, I, I think what this crisis shows is just how deep the roots are and how, um, and how serious the affection and respect is. And, and you think that... Um... Do you think that continues after this, you know, as people kind of have this self this urge for self-sufficiency and pull up the drawbridge? Do you think after we get through this, there will still be a, a reservoir of goodwill uh, between the countries, e even with all the strains that you mentioned? Yeah, I think there will be. Uh, for us in Canada, you know, you're the only neighbor we have. And, uh, and in the United States, you don't have a lot of choices either. Uh, so we can't change our geography, but we also can't ch change our shared history. You know, we fought through world wars together. We've uh, we've been in regional conflicts together. Uh, we have a shared history in terms of economic commerce. The supply trains are intact. Our economies are fully integrated, and we're friends and we share values, and that fundamentally won't change. Politicians will come and go. Um, but those things that we have in common will stay. You know, I agree with you. And actually, one of the things that the Canadian American Business Council has been proposing is um, as we look at uh, not only the crisis, but the rebuild after, uh, we, th we think there could be a bilateral agreement. Maybe it's a memorandum of understanding that says whatever we do, uh, let's do it together. So we modeled it on the 1963 Canada-US Defense Production Sharing Agreement, which has been in place all these years. And, you know, in the Pentagon, Canadian suppliers are treated as Americans. And it's been that way um, for all of these years. So we're saying, you know, that's a, that's a model that works. It works for an entire sector. Why don't we build it out across all sectors so that when we getting through this crisis, but also in the, the humanitarian health crisis, but also in the economic rebuild, we treat each other as domestic. Um, that, 
that that's getting good traction in in Canada um, with the people I've talked to. Do you uh, you spend a lot of time with Americans and policymakers? Do you have a lot of friends here? Do you think that kind of an idea um, could make its way uh, through Washington? I mean, I'm I'm cautiously hopeful, but it's a, it's a tougher sled here. Yeah, I love the idea. Uh, I think it helped us with Section 232 because the Defense Department weighed in and said, look, Canadian aluminum is critical to our defense industries. Uh, I think that um, we saw an example uh, with 3M uh, providing protective gear to Canada where the U.S. attempted to be more isolationist, but public opinion worked against it. I think um, it would be, it'll be a tougher slog in the U.S. right now. There's no doubt the move is protectionist. As we go into the election, probably both sides of the aisle are going to be a bit more protectionist. But it may be that the antipathy, if I can use that word towards China, will work in our favor. Everybody needs friends. And so if your friends, and right now in the United States, I'm putting words in your mouth, but your friends aren't necessarily uh, at the global level. So you do need friends in the neighborhood. And so I think the argument it makes a lot of sense today. And I think probably when we get a presidential election behind us and sober minds start to uh, uh, start to have a chance to look at what situation the world's in, I think there's a market for that idea. I like the idea a lot. It makes a lot of sense. Otherwise, we're going to get into continuous rounds of protectionism. And, you know, even sharing information and solutions on the pandemic crisis of a clinical nature should be important to our shared security as well. So pursue the idea. It's a good idea. Thank you. So let me, I want to ask you something about um, how provinces and states have reacted to this pandemic. Because one of the things that, you know, we, we focused a lot on keeping the Canada-US border open for essential commerce, uh, when yes. and it's still closed to um, leisure travel and, and holidays and things like that. But it's it's essentially, it's open for essential commerce, which is a very good and necessary thing. But but while that was happening, we were totally focused on that Canada U.S. border. But we heard from our members, states and provinces all kind of did their own thing about who were they who are they going to let in and out. And so, do you, do you think there will be some lessons learned from this, um, uh, from this crisis in Canada as between the provinces about? You know, you still need to get be able to get from point A to point B. Um, sure. Is that like? Do you do you think do you think we're going to come out with some lessons learned, or do you think we're going to have to keep learning learning the same pro? You know, reinventing the solutions every every time something comes up. Well, it may be more of the latter. Uh, I think the decision, uh, largely with the help of your advocacy, was a rational, sensible, pragmatic one keep the border open for essential commerce, uh, but close for other purposes. And the two countries are not treating each other differently from the way we're treating each other internally. We have borders up all across Canada between provinces, as you do with states. We also have borders up even within provinces. In Quebec, we have almost different zones. And other provinces are similar, and so are many U.S. states. So what's happened here, I think, is rational. Uh, I hope that we can return to a normal state as quickly as possible. Um, but I don't think it's a bad thing, um, Scotty, that we, that we allow states and provinces to have a certain amount of independence to forge their own path. Um, what's true between New York and Ontario right now would not be tr true between Maine and New Brunswick at the present time or even Washington State and British Columbia. So there, there probably will be different horses for different courses. Well, and, and what do you mean? Like when, you, when you're talking about New York and Ontario, what are you referring to? Well, I'm, I'm saying that in both cases, they have very serious infestations and are not ready to look at any form of relaxation uh, at, this, at this stage. Right. Of course, there are other parts of the country where that would not necessarily be the case. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing I thought I'd ask you about is, I want to see if you've seen it, is um, we are, you and I um, are really fortunate. We get to continue to live, you know, we're working from home and that's inconvenient, but we can still get our groceries. We can get whatever we need delivered um, to our homes. And that's because of um, 
frontline workers and it's because of like truckers <laughs> who move things and, and trains who, you know, we're, we're getting um, critical just life essentials delivered to us and delivered to local stores. And yet there seems to be, um, you've noticed with the trucking community in particular, they, they get shunned, you know, they, they're, they're used to stopping at a place to, um, right. you know, get a snack, use the washroom and, and continue on. And that's, you know, they're close to them. So do, do you think, so, so I started a thank, I, I joined in, I didn't start at a thank a trucker um, kind of, Kind of rally cry. Do, do you think that people will um, start coming out of this appreciating uh, frontline workers who before we took for granted or who were maybe invisible or unappreciated um, for the really central role they play in our lives? Do you think that might be one of the legacies of this uh, of this whole crisis, or do you think we might forget again? Yeah, no, I, th I think it will be a legacy. Uh, truckers. Uh, have labored in relative silence for a long time and perhaps without appreciation. And it's been hard to recruit people to the jobs. But uh, uh, I think increasingly there's momentum for what you're talking about. I know along the 401, uh, rest stops have opened up and they've made sure wa washroom facilities are available and uh, food available for our truckers. These are essential services. Uh, I have, uh, I'd say, a courier service probably three times a day coming here to the door. And, uh, and everything under the sun is, is being delivered. And th this is our lifeline. Um, and we've, we've created new lifelines. It's, th this is the most amazing experience, uh, but it's, it's a lesson in human adaptability too, as to how we can cope with uh, uh, extraordinary circumstances. And we do need uh, not only our healthcare professionals and, uh, and, and, and others uh, who are on the front lines, we need to think about the people who are keeping us in food and uh, creature comforts as well. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you for reminding me because that is really important. Uh, well, I have you I want to mention one or two other things uh, because I think they're important in terms of Canada US. And one is the, the importance of having guardrails in the relationship. The relationship really works well. But politicians, I'm one of them, we, we, we let sometimes local or personal interests push us to do irrational things. We need guardrails. We need guardrails like NAFTA or it's called now USMCA or we need guardrails like our impact. We need guardrails, our, our relationships um, on the, with the space agencies, uh, for example. We need all of these things to keep us focused and, and to keep things going well. And uh, we should remember that since the uh, NAFTA was signed, uh, trade has quadrupled between these countries and millions of jobs have been created and poverty worldwide has been reduced by a billion people. Uh, globalization and trade writ large have made extraordinary, extraordinary progress for humanity. We should never forget that because I know there's going to be a reversion to protectionism when this is over. Let's build moats around our countries. That is the wrong thing to do. It's the wrong thing to do for uh, the prosperity of the world. It's the wrong thing to do for the poorest people in the world. So uh, I just remind myself and all of us fight hard to keep the guardrails up that have uh, allowed this great relationship to flourish. That's a phenomenal point, and I totally agree. Um, I just want to ask you one, one more thing, um, Frank. You you have. You know, I, I'm kind of interviewing you right now. You, you, you play that role and you interview people, but you interview world leaders and uh, a lot of uh, notable people. Uh, and I've had the privilege of, of being there to, to watch you work your magic. Is it, who's on your bucket list, Frank, for if you could, if you could sit down and do an armchair dialogue um, with somebody, who, who are the people that you haven't had a chance to talk to um, that, that you'd like to, I, I know, you know, again, I know you've talked to world leaders and you, you know, uh, my former boss and your friend, president Bill Clinton talks a lot about what you talk about, which is localization and we can't turn back from that and, and we can all help each other. So, so who, who are your, who, who's on your bucket list, um, to, yeah, to yeah. have a chat with? It's a great question. I've had the privilege, not necessarily interviewing, but of being with people from Mandela to Shimon Peres, 
uh, who, some of the great people of the world, and I learn from them all. But the people today that I would like to talk to that really impressed me. One would be uh, Angela Merkel in Germany. I think that she's probably the preeminent world leader today. Just solid. I mean, solid. She's been solid in this pandemic. She's been solid all the way through. Uh, Warren Buffett, because he's just so wise, so sage, so balanced. And, you know, the richest guy on every list uh, are the top two or three richest people in the world. But he's always talking about inequality and how we should share more. Just what? Bill Gates. Bill and Melinda Gates, because they literally have taken their wealth to fixing the solutions of the world, the plagued world. Everything from hookworm through to malaria, through to poverty, uh, dysentery, uh, uh, all around the world. I mean, we need to listen to people like that. A seriously smart person who's created an extraordinary uh, empire, but is also doing good work. And the other one is a thought leader, uh, uh, Tom Friedman in the New York Times. Uh, every time I read him, I say, what a wise owl he is. And I'm hoping that political leaders, especially those aspiring to be president in the United States, listen to him. Uh, I think we are in a, in a particularly critical point in our history. I like the idea of a band of rivals coming together and forming a leadership group. And I highly recommend that to uh, Vice President Biden, for example, of reaching across the aisle, bringing the best brains, some of the people I even mentioned, uh, in, in, into your cabinet and, uh, and creating a, just a, an extraordinary resource. So those are some of the names that uh, impress me right now. That's a, that's a good list. I would add to your list um, Christine Lagarde. She's, I think, is doing wow. I had a chance to... Um, to visit with her, Ajay, the MasterCard um, corporate board was in D.C. having a meeting, and Ajay Banga, their CEO, uh, had one a, a, like a Frank McKenna armchair chat at the Institute for Peace with Christine Lagarde, and it was absolutely extraordinary. Uh, and she's doing some really amazing things around the world. So this is an amazing woman. I had a chance to spend two hours in a swimming pool with her. Uh, Are you allowed to talk about that, Frank? Oh, yeah, this one is all, um, uh, you know, it passes uh, the censor board. Uh, but anyway, we, uh, Rob Pritchard and I took a break from all of this stuff and went out and just had a swim. And lo and behold, she decides to come out and have a swim as well. And the three of us uh, stood in that pool and talked for at least two or three hours. It was an amazing experience. She's a, she is an amazing woman. Right now, she has got one of the biggest jobs on the planet and, uh, and handling it well. Uh, you know, we, we have to thank a lot of these selfless people, the central bankers of the world, our Mark Carney, for example, uh, Tiff Macklin now, and, uh, and, and uh, Powell in the U.S. for the work they do, and, uh, and the leadership, uh, the, the public health leadership. Um, I watch TV uh, at night to watch the public health leaders. They're just amazing people. And uh, we couldn't we couldn't get through this without their inspiration. I completely agree. So so Frank, are you gonna are you gonna spend the rest of the summer in New Brunswick, or do you think you're gonna uh, get back to Toronto anytime soon, or get back to your other travels? What's the yeah. what's the plan? Well, <laughs> I'm hoping to get back to travel and getting back to uh, to work, but uh, we literally can't go to work. I I left Toronto as soon as they closed our office tower down because uh, I can work more productively here. I work all day, all night from the various tools that are available to us and can still get out and hit a tennis ball or uh, go out on my bike or as the case might be. But I really, I was talking about it here with people the other day. I really yearn for the old life, um, going through airports, being on planes, arriving at places, uh, being in meetings with really uh, interesting people in, energized environments. I miss that. Um, I think this is working out well. But um, yeah, I, you know, a lot of people talk about will people ever leave their homes when the uh, lockout finally ends. Most people can't wait to get out of their homes, I think, and socialize again. And how about you? Don't you want to get back and get at it? You know, I, um, there, there are certain things I definitely want to do. Um, 
I have loved having my kids home. Um, we, we work from our separate corners all day and uh, we have dinner as a family every night. And that is uh, a huge gift because, because mm -hmm. even before they left the house, you know, they were busy with sports and activities and I was traveling with work. So family dinner um, was something that we were lucky if we got it twice a week, that would have been a great week. And now we have it every single night um, for the last 10 weeks. So that's, um, that's a, I'd see that as a real blessing, but, but sure, I want to, I want to get back, get back into the mix. I, I remember visiting you in your office in that TD tower one day in Toronto and everybody, and you're up on that executive floor and there was, you know, meetings going on and everybody had on that TD green. And I, yeah. it was like, what in the world is going on? Do they make you wear green? And you said, no, it's picture day. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a green tie in your desk, I think, that you were going to put on. But anyway, um, I, it's, yeah. it's a wonderful place to work and, and, and a wonderful place to be. So I can see why you'd want to get back there. Well, yeah, and, and there's a bit of a following around it. Um, two other quick things. I agree with you, by the way, on, on there's some things that have brought great joy to our lives that we should keep. And I think all of us should learn from that. I, um, I tried to learn a little bit every day. And... Uh, late last night, uh, I ended up um, reading an article in the Wall Street Journal about the importance of gratitude and um, made me realize that uh, we need to have perspective in life. Uh, and, and every day is a better day when we get to share our blessings and thank people for what they've done. And so I want to thank you right now. You have kept the flame alive on this U.S.-Canada relationship for a long time. And uh, a lot of us look at you with huge, uh, with just huge admiration for doing that. Thank you for doing that. Oh my gosh, Frank, uh, thank you. Thank you for saying that, but also thank you for everything that you do. You know, you, uh, I, I met you when you were premier, or just, just leaving as premier, and, and you went on to be ambassador and then, and then this um, iconic business leader. And you, you bring people together um, and you do it with, uh, insight and a sense of humor and and a way that 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 is so relatable that uh, i i appreciate your leadership and your friendship and um everything you do for the canada u.s relationship thank you thank you thank you all right well is there anything else uh anything else we should um we want to say before we before we wrap up well, look um i'm just i'm not one for doing this often but to quote the words of the bible this too shall pass, and uh, we will look back on this in a year or two, and we'll have huge learnings from it. Uh, I don't know what they are, but I hope it makes us better as 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 people, and as residents of this planet. And I hope we take the same efforts that we've applied towards this health crisis, perhaps to the climate crisis and to inequality crises. Uh, that would be a good thing if we could come out of this doing some good things, that would be good. And, you know, if we're just kinder to other people, that would be a good thing. Very well said. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, I don't think we can top that, Frank. I think that's a great way to end. So thanks for um, having me. Thank you very much for doing this.